Good morning, Faith Community Church. Pastor Tony here. Well, we're glad that you can be with us this morning for our online worship service. But first, a few quick announcements. Everything you need is on our church website. Our friendship register, if you have prayer requests, uh, you can give online or write a check and mail that to the church if you'd like. Our sermon notes. We even have some videos teaching for our children. Now, if you're a techie person, you know what to do. You can just hit those links at the bottom of the screen. If you have your phone or your iPad, you know what to do. Everybody's getting a little stir crazy. We know that. But praise God, we have the technology to, to worship together. Good morning, everyone, and happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. Thank you so much for all that you do, especially now that we are in this season. I know you. a lot of you guys are just working extra time, teaching your kids and feeding your families. So thank you so much, moms. Thank you for everything you do. We appreciate you all. And this morning, before we start singing, I want to invite us to read a passage from Scripture and just to make this our prayer. It comes from Psalm 145, and it'll be on your screen. So let's read together. It says, I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. And we're going to be singing about this truth this morning, how God, his greatness, it's unsearchable. And we can't comprehend it. We can't really describe it. And we're going to sing this classic song that you might know. So we, we hope that you do know it. So you can sing along with us. If you're not familiar with it, the words will be on the screen. So we invite you now to join with us as we just proclaim this, that God is indescribable. From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea, creation's revealing your majesty. The colors. From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring.
Christ who lives within me. From beginning to the end, you deserve the glory. You deserve the glory. from the book of Titus. It'll be up on the screen as well. It says, For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy and hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And we know that this is true. Because of his grace, we have been saved. It's not because of what we have done but because of what he has done. And because of that, we are heirs with Christ now. We are chosen, we're not forsaken. And we know that God, he tells us these things, that we are these things, but we know it's because of what he has done, not because of what we have done, what we try to do. It's all simply because of what Jesus has done at the cross for us. So we can sing this next song with confidence and knowing that we are who he says that we are because he says so, because he has done it. So let's sing.
mighty and powerful God. It overwhelms me that someone so powerful, the creator of every small and large thing on this earth, loves me. Because I know that I don't deserve it. But you are so, so good. We are in a time that can bring so many emotions. Sadness, depression, loneliness, Father. But with you, there is never a lonely moment because you are always right there beside us. Because you are good. Lord, I lift up anyone who is feeling those moments of desperation and just want to cry out and maybe nobody's there, Lord. May they turn to you. May they turn to the good, good Father that you are. May they know that there are people who love them and will pray for them and will pray with them because that's what you've called us to do. May this not be a time where we crawl deeper and deeper into a whole Lord Jesus. May we take this time to open our Bible more, pray more, Lord Jesus. Call that friend we haven't spoken to, Lord Jesus, and share the love of you because you are good. And we just thank you for this time of worship that we've had together, Lord. And we ask all of these things in your name. Amen. Happy Mother's Day. What do you like best about mom? Well, giving her kisses. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Um, mom, I just wanted to thank you for everything you've done for me. I mean, I wouldn't even be here if you hadn't adopted me. So I just want to thank you for everything you do for me. and your continuous love for me even even when we fight um, but we always make up in the end and I just want you to know that I appreciate you and I love you I hope you have a good day my mom's very pretty and nice and I love her very much and she takes care of me I love you mom because you do a lot of spur the moment things I, I love, love my mom because she cuddles with me and she's a big encouragement to me Happy Mother's Day. Um, I like Mama because um, who plays with me? I think Mama to say. Happy Mother's Day. Hey, Mom. I hope you have a good day. Happy Mother's Day, too. Ha Hi, Mom. I hope you have a good day today. And I hope you have so much fun. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day! Happy Mother's Day! Happy Mother's Day, Mom! Go! Happy Mother's Day! Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day, Day, Mom! Thank you for all you do. We love you. Yes. Okay, Benji, what do you love about your mom? Um, well, I like her because we, uh, we, like, she makes us supper. Mmm. I love the rice and beans. Ooh. How about you, Susie? What do you love about your mom? Look up this way. She makes breakfast. Ooh, yay. Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day. Day. Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day. Day. What I love about my mom is she always supports us in our sports. Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day. Day. Happy Mother's Day. Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day. Day.
Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day. Day. Thanks for taking us to the ice rink, Mom. Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day. Day. We, we love, love you, Mom. Mom. Happy Mother's Day to all you mothers out there. Happy Mother's Day. One reason I'm thankful for my mom is because I like to have fun with her and we have a lot of fun while we cook and bake. I'm thankful that our mom takes time out of her day One reason I love my mom is that she's my best friend and she's always here for me. Happy, Happy Mother's Day! Day. Good morning and happy Mother's Day. Today's message is not going to be your typical feel-good Mother's Day. In fact, there's going to be a PG-13 rating for violence. Uh, but since it talks about a mother, we're going to use this passage in Judges for a Mother's Day message. And mom, if you're watching in Florida, the card's on its way. And there should be money in it to buy a flower for yourself. Actually, there's no money in it, so forget the flower. Mother's Day. Make sure that uh, you call your mother's uh, congregation uh, if they're still living and wish them a happy Mother's Day. We're in a study from Hebrews chapter 11 called By Faith. Our theme verse is verse 6, which says, And without faith... It is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. And for this whole series, I've been trying to impress upon your hearts that it's vital that we as believers in Jesus Christ live by faith. The verse that we're looking at today in Hebrews chapter 11 is verse 32. And it says, what more shall I say? For time will fail me, the writer is saying, time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets. And the verse goes on to verse 33 for more saying. Now last week I suggested to you that these six names in verse 32 are divided into three groups. And in each group of two names, the second name precedes the first name in Scripture. So Barak really preceded Gideon, Jephthah precedes Samson, and Samuel precedes David. And the first four names, Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, are all found in the book of Judges. And three of those four were judges, meaning military leaders. Now Barak, like Gideon, was an insecure man. We'll get to that when we look at the text. When it comes to obeying God, he showed some insecurity. And Barak is recorded in Judges chapters 4 and chapter 5, and I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Judges chapter 4. We'll begin reading in Judges 4 in just a minute. But since it's Mother's Day, I titled the message today, Deborah, More Than Just a Mom. Deborah, More Than Just a Mom. Now, before we look at Judges chapter 4, it's important that we understand that in the book of Judges, there is this recurring sin cycle, a five-stage sin cycle. And it starts off with the word sin. Stage one is sin. Israel falls into sin. They do evil in the sight of Yahweh, in the sight of the Lord. They are forsaking the Lord to worship and serve other gods like the Baals and like the Asherah the gods of the Canaanites. And so the second stage in this cycle is servitude. Israel is oppressed by other nations. Many times it uses the word, the Lord, Yahweh, sold them into the hand of somebody. The third stage is supplication. Supplication. In this stage, people of Israel cry out to the Lord. It's more of a cry of distress, a cry for help, than a cry for repentance. In other words, you're not normally seeing, we've sinned, we've sinned, and we need your help. More, it's, we just need your help. And God, in his grace, sends a Savior. Stage four, a Savior. God raises up a deliverer to feed the one who's doing the oppressing. We call them judges. And then finally, stage five 
Once the oppressor is gone, there's silence. There is peace in the land until the judge dies. While you're in Judges chapter 4, go back to Judges chapter 3. Let's look at this five-stage cycle as it appears in Judges 3, beginning in verse 7. The sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, forgot the Lord their God, and served the Baals and the Asheroth. That's stage one. They're sinning. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Yahweh got mad at Israel for their wayward ways, and so he sold them into the hand of Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. Stage two. And the sons of Israel served Cushan Rishathaim for eight years. When the sons of Israel cried to the Lord, that's stage three, they cry out to the Lord, supplication. The Lord raised up a deliverer. Stage four, here's the Savior. The deliverer for the sons of Israel to deliver them. Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel. When he went out to war, the Lord gave Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, so that he prevailed over Cushan Rishathaim. And here's stage 5, verse 11. The land had rest for 40 years, and Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. Usually when the deliverer, the judge, dies, look at the very next verse, verse 12. The sons of Israel again did evil. It goes right back to the next stage. So now we're in chapter 4. And I'm going to ask you, is the sin cycle here in Judges 4? And the answer is going to be yes. But before we look at that, would you join me in prayer? Lord, we come before you. We want to understand about this man named Barak who made it into the Heroes of Faith chapter. He does show some insecurity, but you did use him as a military leader. But most of all, you used this woman by the name of Deborah. Help us to gain insight into her life into who you've created her to be. And on this Mother's Day, may we gain some principles that we see from her life. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The sin cycle in chapter 4, verse 1. The sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. He was the judge in chapter 3 towards the end. Not the last one, because verse 31 gives us another judge. But Ehud has died. And so the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. And the commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harosheth Hagoyim. The sons of Israel cried to the Lord, for he had 900 iron chariots, and he oppressed the sons of Israel severely for 20 years. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lipidoth, was judging Israel at the time. She used to sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the sons of Israel came up to her for judgment. Now she sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kedesh Naphtali, and said to him, Behold, the Lord, the God of Israel, has commanded, Go and march to Mount Tabor, and take with you 10,000 men from the sons of Naphtali and from the sons of Zebulun. And I will draw out to you Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his many troops to the river Kishon, and I will give them into your hand. So you can see the sin cycle. Verse 1, they're sinning. They did evil in the sight of the Lord. Verse 2, servitude. Jobin, he's the king of Canaan, and he's got a commander named Sisera. Supplication is in verse 3, where they cry out to the Lord. And in stage 4, Savior, verses 4 through 6, we have Deborah, who's judging, calls for Barak to come and be the military commander. Now, you're not going to find the fifth stage until the next chapter, in chapter 5, at the very end of the chapter. Chapter 5 is basically a poem of everything that takes place in chapter 4. Chapter 4 is narrative. Chapter 5 is poetic. 
And at the very end of verse 31, it goes back to narrative. It goes back to prose where it says, and the land was undisturbed for 40 years. Silence. All five stages, again, are going to appear in the Deborah Barak story. Now, going back to my title, Deborah was more than just a mom. Now, I'm not denigrating women who are moms. There's nothing wrong with being a stay-at-home mom. It's a worthy calling. But I also want to say there's nothing wrong with being a working mom either. How do we even know Deborah was a mom? Well, chapter 5 in the poem, it says this in verse 7. The peasantry ceased. They ceased in Israel until I, Deborah, arose, until I arose a mother in Israel. She's a mom. She's a mom. So my title today is Deborah was more than just a mom. Two main points with a lot of subpoints under them. First, Deborah was a wife who worked outside of the home. She was a wife who worked outside of the home. How do we know she's a wife? Well, it told us that. It says that in verse 4. She's the wife of Lipidoth. Now, we know nothing about Lipidoth. It's the only time his name occurs in Scripture. There's nothing said about him in this whole account in chapter 4. All we know is that he was the husband to Deborah. And we know that she's a mother, but we know nothing about her kids. They're not mentioned at all. It just mentions in chapter 5, verse 7, that she was a mom. A mother. So let's go to the next point. She was a judge. She was a judge. Now, most judges and judges are military commanders. She's not going to be a military commander. In fact, the text is really making it clear that she's a judge in the judicial sense. If you looked at verse 5, it says she used to sit under the palm tree, and they even gave that palm tree a name, the palm tree of Deborah, between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. Now, Bethel's in the hill country of Ephraim. Ramah is not so much. And the sons of Israel came up to her for judgment. She was more of a judicial judge that you would see in court system. She would be trying civic cases or uh, morality cases that would come before her. Obviously, she must have known the law, the Torah, because people came to her for judgment. Now, I want to use a map. The one that's on the screen tells you all the tribes of Israel. See that? That makes it really not so clear to see. And I don't have a laser pointer to point them all out to you. So I went old school. My father is 89 years old. He teaches a Sunday school lesson in Florida, and they weren't allowed to meet. So he was doing his from his living room, and he'd have his whiteboard next to him, and he'd be teaching through the Bible with his whiteboard. So in honor of my dad on Mother's Day, I'm going to use a whiteboard. Now, of course, I don't have a laser pointer. I have this. What a cool pointer this is. Okay, so let's go through this a little bit. This is the Mediterranean Sea. This whole thing is here is the Mediterranean Sea. Notice my instructions, not to scale, okay? <laughs> this is not going to be to scale, and this is copyrighted by Bob Cole, so don't write this yourself. Okay, not to scale. Key people, we have Deborah, Barak, and a woman, Jael. We haven't gotten to her yet, but we also know Jabin and Sisera. Now, Jobin is the king of Canaan, and Jobin's headquarters is in this little city called Hazor. It's in the northern part of Canaan. This whole area used to be called Canaan, Hazor. Now, his commander, Sisera, is in Harosheth Hagoyim, which is over here by Mount Carmel. Now, I put some other cities here, Megiddo and Tanakh, because they'll play a little bit into the story. And this whole valley is called the Jezreel Valley, and Jezreel is located right there. In the black, you see the different tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel. This body of water is the Sea of Galilee. It's really a, just a large lake, and then it has a Jordan River that goes down to the Dead Sea, or the Sea of Salt. It's all salt. Nothing lives in that. The two and a half tribes that were on the, on the east side of the Jordan River were Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh. Manasseh's oldest son, Machir, is the one who wanted to settle over on that side. The other half of Manasseh is on the west side of the Jordan River. 
So in this valley, you have Issachar, Zebulon, and a little bit of Asher. Naphtali is more in this Galilee area. And we know that Sisera is over here, and we have Deborah way down here, and Rama and Bethel in the area of Benjamin and Ephraim. Now, Bethel's in the hill country of Ephraim, but she did her judging down here. She would go between Rama and Bethel, and the tree of Deborah, the palm tree, was somewhere in between those two places. Jerusalem's not mentioned at all. That's in Judah. It's between Benjamin and Judah. That, that, that's just giving you some place names of where Jerusalem is. Mount Tabor plays a part in this story. And here's Kadesh of Naphtali. This is where Barak comes from. So Deborah's way down here. Barak is way up here. And this oak in Zanim will play into the account a little bit later. The Kishon River is this little river that flows, actually goes northward because it comes from the mountains. Now, it's not really a river. The text called it a river. It's what's called a wadi. A wadi is like a creek or a brook. But when the rain comes into the mountains, it flows down into this wadi and it becomes a river. And you know that in like Nevada and different places when they have flash floods, there's a dry creek bed. But when the floods come, the rain comes, you got to be away from that flash flood because you could drown in it. Well, that's what the Kishon River can become. It can become a torrent when the rains come. Okay, we'll get to the map in a little bit. We're told that she's a judge. And the location is in the south in the Benjamin area between Ramah and Bethel, and people came to her for judgment. We're told not only that she's a wife, but we know she's a mom and a judge, but she's also a prophetess. In fact, that's the first thing mentioned in verse 4 of chapter 4. Now, Deborah, a prophetess. God spoke through both prophets and prophetesses. The office was not gender-based. In the Old Testament, Miriam was called a prophetess in Exodus 15, verse 20. In 2 Kings 22, verse 14, during Josiah's reign, there was this prophetess named Holda. In the New Testament, Anna, the one who came and saw baby Jesus in Luke 2, 36, was called a prophetess. And Philip, the evangelist, had four daughters in Acts chapter 21, 8 and 9, and those four daughters were all prophetesses. And as a prophetess, Deborah summoned Barak to lead an army for Israel. Now remember, Barak is north by the Sea of Galilee in this place called Kedesh Naphtali. And as a prophetess, she is one who speaks for God. And look what she tells him in verses 6 and 7 when she summoned him. So he went south to Ramah and Bethel, that area, and he was told this by the prophetess. Behold, Yahweh, the Lord, the God of Israel, has commanded, this is God's word through the prophetess, go and march to Mount Tabor, take with you 10,000 men from the sons of Naphtali and from the sons of Zebulun, and I will draw out, that's God speaking, I will draw out to you Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his many troops to the river Kishon, and I will give him into your hand. Those are the instructions, but look at the promise. I will give him into your hand. Israel's got no chariots. They don't even have instruments of warfare, basically. They just have farm instruments. There's 900 chariots on Sisera's side, many warriors, and the Lord is saying, I will give them into your hand. And he agrees on a condition. He says in verse 8, Barak said to her, if you will go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. There's a condition he's showing he's basically insecure. He doesn't trust God at his word. And yet in Hebrews chapter 11, he's called a man of faith because he's in the faith chapter. But he's definitely showing his insecurity. And Deborah agrees in verse 9. She says, 
I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the honor shall not be yours on the journey that you are about to take. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hands of a woman. And you're reading this and you think, okay, who's the woman going to be? And we think it's going to be Deborah. She's going to be the woman. Well, the text kind of leaves us hanging right away. We don't know for sure who this is going to be. But Deborah agrees to go, although she prophesies the honor won't be his. Deborah was a wife who worked outside the home. But secondly, I want you to notice Deborah took a stand against an evil culture. She took a stand against an evil culture. She was a leader. Now turn to the poetry section in Judges chapter 5. Look at verse 6. In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the day of Jael, the highways were deserted, and travelers went by roundabout ways. The peasantry ceased. They ceased in Israel until I, Deborah, arose, until I arose a mother in Israel. New gods were chosen. It seems that according to this poem, when things got bad, she took action. People were afraid to travel the roads because of the Canaanites who were in charge. They had to go by back roads. It says here that the peasantry cease. That means rural living, living on your land out in the open, away from other people. Well, that stopped because they were always threatened. There was no protection. Rural living ceased. False gods were chosen. Israelites started to worship the false gods, the gods of the Canaanites, the Baals, and the Asherah. And she wouldn't sit idly by. She took action. She's a leader. She stood up to the culture. It's really clear. It says, until I, until I, Deborah, rose. In other words, she couldn't take it any longer. I've got to do something in this evil culture. culture. And Deborah rose and became the leader. See, that's why I'm saying she's more than a wife and a mom. She is that, but she's more than that. She rose, took action. As a judge, she was righting the wrongs of the society. And as a prophetess, she is waiting for God to take the initiative when to act. We don't know how long it was that she was being a prophetess and a judge before God finally told her, you need to summon Barak now. We do know from the text that Jabin was ruling over Israel for 20 years. And she waited on the Lord When is it time to take action? And when the Lord finally told her, now's the time, she summoned Barak, and he comes down, and she tells him, this is what the Lord wants you to do. She became a leader. But she's also a supporter of leaders. Back in chapter 4, when Barak says, if you don't go with me, I'm not going to go, she says, I will go with you. And at the very end of verse 9, notice Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kedesh. So let's get this account again from the map. She's down here in this area, and she summons Barak to come down from Kedesh down to this area. And when he says, if you go with me, I'll go and do this. But if you don't go with me, I'm not going to do it. She says, I'll go with you. And then she did travel with him back up to Kadesh in Naphtali. So she's here. She's supporting the leader. And in verse 10, it says, Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali together to Kadesh, and 10,000 men went up with him, meaning went up with him according to the instructions to Mount Tabor, And notice how she supported him. Deborah also went up with him. So here, Barak is calling people to follow him. What were the two tribes that he called in verse uh, 10? Naphtali and Zebulun. 
Naphtali and Zebulun, 10,000 men from here came to Kedesh. And then she, Deborah, with Barak and the 10,000 traveled to Mount Tabor right here as the Lord directed. She's a supporter of leaders. And if you look at verses 11 through 16, you'll see that she motivated leaders to act. Verse 11 says, Now Heber the Kenite had separated himself from the Kenites, from the sons of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, and had pitched his tent as far away as the oak in Zananim, which is near Kedesh. Now we're going to get back to that story in a minute about that guy. Verse 12 Then they told Sisera, we're not sure who the they are, it might be Heber. And they told Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor. So Sisera called together all his chariots, 900 iron chariots, and all the people who were with him from Harosheth Hagoyim to the river Kishon. Deborah said to Barak, so here's the enemy coming together down to the river Kishon. And Deborah said to Barak, Here's how she's going to motivate him. Arise, for this is the day which the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Behold, the Lord has gone out before you. So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army with the edge of the sword before Barak, and Sisera alighted from his chariot and fled away on foot. But Barak pursued the chariots and the army as far as Harosheth Hagoyim, and all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword, not even one was left. So it tells us here in the account, huge victory. Deborah says, arise, today is the day, today is the day the Lord's giving him into your hands. And the Lord has gone on before you. In verse 15, notice it says, The Lord routed Sisera. How? How did the Lord do that? It looked like the battle was uh, Barak's and his men. How did the Lord get involved? Well, that's where you got to go back to the poetry section. Chapter 5. Looking at verse 19. The kings came and fought. Then fought the kings of Canaan. So that's parallelism. The kings came and fought. It's not talking about Israelite kings. There are no kings yet. These are the kings of the Canaanites. And where are they? They fought at Tanakh, near the waters of Megiddo. They took no plunder in silver. In other words, they're not going to be victorious. They took no plunder. They took no spoils. The stars fought from heaven. From their courses, they fought against Sisera. The torrent of Kishon swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent Kishon. O oh, my soul, march on with strength. Then the horse's hoofs beat from the dashing, the dashing of the valiant steeds. In those verses, we can see how the Lord in poetry section, how the Lord took place, how the Lord routed. Here back at the map, we have all of them coming down from Mount Tabor. Sisera with his 900 chariots and men come down here to the river Kishon. Here we have rain coming down, lots of rain. That's what it means by the heavens, the stars. In other words, it's talking about the heavens, that rain came down into the mountains. The mountains then let that water flow down to the wadi, and the wadi became a gushing river. And the chariots and the horses, they got mired in this and allowed the Israelite men to come and defeat them in battle because they couldn't really move. The Lord was actively a part of the battle. We also see that Deborah praised those who fought, but she also chided those who didn't. Staying in chapter 5, she sang the praises of those tribes who fought in battle. Look at verse 14. 
from Ephraim, those whose root is an Amalek came down. Now, I think Amalek should be in the valley, as the ESV and New Revised Standard Version has. Instead of Amalek, there's one letter difference in the two words, valley and Amalek. Following you, Benjamin, with your peoples, for Machir, commanders, came down. And from Zebulun, those who wield the staff of office and the princes of Issachar were with Deborah. As was Issachar, so was Barak. Into the valley they rushed at his heels. In other words, Barak is leading the way and the army is coming on his heels. Among the divisions of Reuben, now it changes. But here we see praises being sung for Ephraim, Benjamin, Machir, Zebulun, and Issachar. Now back here at the map, Benjamin's down here, Ephraim's down here in the south land. They came north to fight. Machir from this side comes over, crosses, and he joins them to fight. So you have people from the south coming northward to fight against Sisera. You have Issachar and Naphtali and Zebulon. They're coming down to fight. And so you have the Israelites on one side, and you have the Israelites on the other side, and you have Sisera in the middle, the Lord sending rain that's making it really hard. And so Deborah is praising these tribes who joined into the battle. She's praising them. But she also shames those who didn't join. At the end of verse 15, it says, Among the divisions of Reuben, there was great resolves of heart. You're thinking this heart is to join the battle. But she goes on to say, Why did you sit among the sheepfolds? to hear the piping for the flocks among the divisions of Reuben. There was great searchings of heart. In other words, what Deborah is writing here is they're debating, they're saying, should we join, should we not join, what should we do? And they ended up sitting still, not doing anything. Gilead remained across the Jordan. And why did Dan stay in ships? And Asher sat at the seashore and remained in its landing. And so here we have tribes. Gilead is this area called Gad. You have Dan. You have Asher. These are all tribes that did not join in the battle. They sat it out. Gilead, Dan, Asher, Reuben. Cowardice. They would not join. That tells me that she summoned other tribes, not just Barak to get those, but she summoned the tribes to say, come fight against Jabin and Sisera. And she praises those who come and shames those who didn't come for their cowardice. But Deborah's strongest sentiment of praise was reserved for a woman. Who's the woman? Well, the woman praised is Jael. She's the wife of Heber the Kenite. Now remember, back in chapter 4, verse 11, we see that Heber separated from the other Kenites. Judges chapter 1, verse 16 tells us that the Kenites who came up with Moses, remember Moses married a woman who was of the tribe of Midian, and Jethro, or Ruel, was the father, and Hobab is Ruel, or Jethro's son, and he invited him to come and show them the land. And so they end up crossing the Jordan River, and they settled down here below Judah, below Simeon. The Kenites settled down here. Heber said, I'm not going to settle down here with the other uh, Kenites. He travels way up here to the Oak of Zanim, and he's there. He separates to come up here. And so Heber has a wife named Jael. Look at verse 17. Sisera fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite, for there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazor, and the house of Heber, the Kenite. Remember the battle. Pinch her movements. The, the whole army with their chariots try to go back to Harasheth Tagoyim. They go this way. Sisera gets off on foot, and he goes this way. He travels to the flatland, and then goes north, go, probably heading up to Hazor, where Jabin is, and he's heading there. He stops at the oak in Zaanim, to where there's peace between the king of Hazor and Heber the Kenite. 
Verse 18, Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my master, turn aside to me. Do not be afraid. And he turned aside to her and into the tent, and she covered him with a rug. He said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. So she opened a bottle of milk and gave him a drink, and then she covered him. He said to her, Stand in the doorway of the tent, and it shall be if anyone comes and inquires of you and says, Is there anyone here that you should say no? Does he feel like he's in a safe place? Yeah. Sisera feels like he went to a safe place. After all, Heber is at peace with the Canaanites, the king of Canaan. And Sisera flees to the tent of Jael. She goes out to meet him. She even shows hospitality, giving him milk instead of water. Well, she showed hospitality up to a point. Because in verse 21, Jael, Heber's wife, took a tent peg, seized a hammer in her hand, and went secretly to him and drove the peg into his temple, and it went through into the ground, for he was sound asleep and exhausted, and he died. I told you this is a great Mother's Day message, isn't it? He's sound asleep and... She kills him. Verse 22. And behold, as Barak pursued Sisera, Jael came out to meet him and said to him, Come, and I will show you the man whom you are seeking. And he entered, meaning he entered the tent with her, and behold, Sisera was lying dead with a tent peg in his temple. The woman's being praised for her contribution in the battle. But look how chapter 5 in the poetry section praises her. She's praised in song by Deborah, beginning in verse 24. Most blessed of women is Jael, Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenites. Most blessed is she of women in the tent. She's called most blessed twice in one verse. And I know this is a song, but I'm not sure how you're going to put verses 25 through 27 together into music. It goes on to say, he asked for water, she gave him milk. In a magnificent bowl, she brought him curds. She reached out her hand for the tent peg and her right hand for the workman's hammer. Then she struck Sisera, she smashed his head, and she shattered and pierced his temple. Do you think you can make this into a song? Diana says no. But look, 27 is like the chorus. It's like the refrain. Between her feet he bowed, he fell, he lay. Between her feet he bowed, he fell. Where he bowed, there he fell dead. Now you're all thinking this is pretty gruesome. She's called most blessed of women is Jael. You get to verse 28, and in Deborah's song, she continues this song with, well, I would call it mockery. Out of the window, she looked and lamented. We don't know who this woman is, but out of the window, she looked and lamented. Now we know the mother of Sisera through the lattice. Why does his chariot delay in coming? Why do the hoofbeats of his chariots tarry? Her wise princesses would answer her. Indeed, she repeats her words to herself. Are they not finding? Are they not dividing the spoil? A maiden or two maidens for every warrior? To Sisera, a spoil of dyed work, a spoil of dyed work embroidered? Dyed work of double embroidery on the neck of the spoiler? I would call this the ultimate biblical your mama trash talk. The mom of Sisera is looking out the window. There's no way we could lose this battle. Why is my son delayed in coming? 
Well, he's delayed because he's dead. Now, how do you make application of this for Jael? Is the Bible condoning murder? Is it okay to kill unsuspecting enemies while they're sleeping? Proverbs 25, 21, and 22 says, If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. And if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. There's nothing about then kill him. Instead, Proverbs 25, 22 says, For you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. It seems like Jael did the opposite. She fed and then killed. So why is she being blessed greatly in this song. Let me give you some of my thoughts. First of all, Deborah prophesied that Yahweh would sell Sisera into the hands of a woman. That was back in chapter 4, verse 9. The Lord prophesied that was going to happen. In chapter 5, verse 22, where Deborah is praising those tribes that came and chiding those tribes that didn't come, that sat out the battle. In verse 23, you have actually curse Miraz. Miraz is a village that's very close to, well, Kadesh Naphtali, where Barak is from. It's a small village, and curse Miraz, but it's not Deborah saying this. The angel of the Lord is saying this. Utterly curses inhabitants. Because they did not come to help, to the help of the Lord. They let Barak and others do the battle, but they sat it out as well. And they should have been involved in the fight because this happened in their hometown area. Because they did not come to the help of the Lord, to help the Lord against the warriors. Who did help the Lord against the warriors? Jael helped the Lord against the the warriors. Third thing I can notice here is Heber may have shown his loyalty to a pagan king and to his gods, but Jael showed her loyalty to Yahweh the Lord and to the Lord's people Israel. You may recount that in the Baal of Peor when Moses is leading the people out of Egypt and they get to the land of Moab and the people started to serve the gods of the Moabites. That's called the Baal of Peor incident. And God was starting to send a plague here. And in Numbers chapter 25, we have a man from the tribe of Levi by the name of Phinehas. He saw a Midianite woman being taken by this lead Israelite man into the tent, presumably for sex. And he took a spear, went into the tent, and stabbed them both through. And it tells us in Numbers 25, He was honored with the perpetual priesthood because he had jealousy for the Lord's jealousy. Seems that Jael had jealousy for the Lord's jealousy. And Jael, very similar to Rahab the harlot, they both were not Israelites. One was a Canaanite background and one was a Midianite background. And she is praised for siding with the Lord and his people over against the Canaanites and the pagans and their false gods. I think that's why she's praised. And the last point I want to make about Deborah is that Deborah was a worshiper of the Lord. See, all of chapter 5 of Judges is a poem And as a worshiper of the Lord, she created a song to praise the Lord. Look at verse 1. Then Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, sang on that day, saying, that the leaders led in Israel, that the people volunteered, bless the Lord. Hear, O kings, give ear, O rulers, I to the Lord, I will sing. I will sing praise to the Lord, the God of Israel. Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the field of Edom, the earth quaked and the heavens also dripped. Even the clouds dripped water. The mountains quake at the presence of the Lord. This Sinai at the presence of the Lord, the God of Israel. The whole first five verses are about praising the Lord. And the thing ends with praising She says this, a wish prayer in verse 31. 
Let your enemies perish, O Lord. But let those who love him be like the rising of the sun in its might. May there be destruction on the Lord's enemies, and may there be rising of glorious might those who love the Lord. Not your typical Mother's Day message, is it? But I want to make two closing points in conclusion. First, to the women. Don't let anyone tell you that you don't have value. Don't let anyone tell you you don't have value. If God has given you a teaching gift, teach. If God's given you a leadership gift, lead. If God has given you the gift of encouragement, encourage. If God has given you the gift of support and help or a gift of wisdom and discernment, then use it for God's glory. Women, you are needed in the body of Christ just as much as men are needed in the body of Christ. You're not second-class worshipers. Now, to both women and men, if you are sitting on the sidelines in the cultural battle between what is evil and what is righteous, then it's time to take a stand. It's time to take a stand. The angel of the Lord, I believe, is the second person of the Trinity in Scripture in the Old Testament. The angel of the Lord cursed the inhabitants of Miraz for sitting out the battle. God praises those who take a stand for him, for showing their loyalty to him and to his word. And we are living in a sinful culture, and we need to start to take a stand. So let me ask, when it comes to the LGBTQ issue, do we stand for the truth of God's word and call these lifestyles sin? Will we lovingly call people involved in that to repentance and faith in Jesus because Jesus forgives all sinners? Will you stand up for God in that area? When it comes to the abortion issue and women's right to terminate an unborn baby, do we stand for truth and call that sin? And will we lovingly call those who push this kind of agenda and those who've had abortions, will we call them to repentance and faith in Jesus because Jesus forgives all kinds of sin? When it comes to racism, and the killing of an unarmed black man for jogging through a white neighborhood. Will we stand for truth and cry out for justice to take place? And if you would see a black man jogging near your home, would you immediately think in your mind, that's a criminal? Is it possible white Christians are racist and not even know it? Do you see people of different color as bearing the image of God and worthy of respect? Do we need to repent of sinful attitudes and seek forgiveness from God? Because God loves the whole world, regardless of color. When it comes to racism, do you see racism as sin? And one more point, and I'm sure I'm going to get some heat over this one. When it comes to the government telling us as a church we cannot meet because of a health issue, what do we do? On the one hand, we ought to obey our governing authorities. Romans 13.1 makes that perfectly clear. We should obey our governing authorities. After all, we do care about our neighbor, we love our neighbor. We don't want people spreading COVID-19. But now our governor is suggesting no groups of over 50 until a vaccine is made. And will he then mandate everyone, you must be vaccinated? See, I struggle with this not having religious freedom to worship. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, let us consider, he's writing to the people, God's people, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. 
not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The writer of Hebrews writes this before our Heroes of Faith chapter. And in our Heroes of Faith chapter, you'll notice that after verse 32, we're going to get to some gruesome people who stood for, for Christ in the midst of great persecution. And in a culture at that time where there was great Roman persecution in the Colosseum against Christians, he's telling the group of Christians, don't forsake meeting together. It might mean death, but don't forsake meeting together. And I know online church is, it's okay, but I got to let you know it's not church. This is not the body of Christ coming together to worship. Acts 2.42 makes it clear what worship is all about. They, they, plural, corporately, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And we can do three of those four things online. The one thing we can't do online is fellowshipping together. That's the church, having things in common, gathering together. And the reason I struggle with the stay-at-home order is I feel convicted personally. I feel convicted that my loyal stand for God and his word is being compromised. Other states are beginning to open up, allowing churches to gather for worship. Jason Payne in Tennessee is going to have week, weekend services, Sunday services. Keith Miller in Indiana is having Weekend services, Sunday services. But here in Illinois, we may not be able to gather at all in 2020. And I'm struggling with this. At what point do we say we must obey God rather than man? I want to obey. but I want to obey the Lord God first and take my stand for him and his word. And if he tells me don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as is the habit of some, I don't want us to get into the habit of not meeting together for worship. I know you're going to give me a lot of emails, pros and con, but I'm asking you to pray for us. We have an elders meeting on Tuesday night and we're going to discuss some of these things. And I need the body of Christ to pray that God gives us his wisdom with regard to we take a stand with the government or against the government. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, I thank you for the woman named Jael who took a stand for you. Her husband took a stand for the Canaanites and for the way of life of the Canaanites, making peace with Jabin, king of Canaan. But Jael took a stand for you. Deborah took a great stand for you. She was a judge. She was a prophetess. She was a leader. As Christ followers, I ask that you would help us to take a stand for you. When it comes to things like abortion, the LGBTQ agenda, racism, and even mandating closures of churches. We want to be a people that show our loyalty to you first, Lord. We need your strength. We need your guidance. And we need to be bold when you tell us what to do. We pray this all in Christ Jesus, our Savior's name. Amen. Happy Mother's Day.
death is defeated, and the king, he is alive. And that's what we celebrate every single single day, honestly. We have Easter, but we have that joy that we get to celebrate it every single day because we know that he defeated death and he is alive forever and ever. So once again, happy Mother's Day to all the moms. Kids, make sure to give your mom a big hug and to make sure to, to, if you don't live with your mom, give her a call this morning. Don't forget to do so. I know our days get jumbled up with quarantine, but don't forget today is Mother's Day. And we are so thankful that we were able to just sing together again this morning. And we will see you all next Sunday back here on, our, on the church's YouTube channel to continue to worship the Lord. So have a great week, and we'll see you next Sunday.